So, so much for this place. Um, now let's think of a, a little bit of a different usage scenario. So, um, can you think of a scenario where it would actually make sense to take away information, diminished reality? Yes. Um, ad blocker on the Times Square, for example. <laughs> okay, ad blocker. That's a nice idea. Yeah, <laughs> that would make sense. Yeah. Uh, if you're working in, let's say, uh, a station or a power station or some place where there's a lot of dials and buttons and a huge display where there's a lot of things to mm -hmm. switch on and off, it's something to get rid of what you don't need to work with. So to kind of reduce information overload. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's actually a sensible scenario. Um, there's actually, yeah? Maybe some surgeries, like for doctors, or... Also, yeah. like, uh, Professor Polish showed this uh, use case of like a car, somebody who's burning the car, so they, they want to see through some part of the car. Ah, okay. While they're burning it. Like a mechanic who's yeah. trying to fix something. Okay, okay, yeah. That's also, yeah? Maybe in exams to avoid cheating. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, also an idea to, to cover every, any, everything else, just you just see your, your exam sheet, maybe. Now that's actually, uh, the, the one I, I found was actually a little more straightforward. This is this kind of setup, which really looks weird in the first place, but this is for, um, for welding. So, uh, of course, you need some kind of, of goggles for welding, because otherwise you would go blind. Um, but here the idea is that you don't just have goggles which darken out the, the, um, uh, the which, which simply remove a lot of light, because then you, um, you can't see the rest of your environment anymore. In, in, instead, you have uh, cameras with a high dyna dynamic range here, and then you can see uh, everything, uh, your workpiece, and the, the welding arc, everything at the same time, and can make much more uh, precise, precise welds, for example. So this is a, an interesting example, of, I think, where you kind of have diminished reality in a sense, because a lot of the, the light coming in from, from the outside is actually just removed. Um, but that's compensated for by uh, giving you the ability to see the rest of the, of the of the work piece much more clearly. Um, so yeah, I've actually tried to, to weld myself, I think once or twice, and the biggest problem for me was that you can't really see what you're doing unless uh, the, the, uh, the arc has already started. And if you're starting it in the wrong place, then you will only notice afterwards. So at least if you have just a regular welding mask. And for that reason, I never really got the hang of it. But with this, you can just look at the workpiece. It looks normal. And then once you start the arc, then you can see just on top of, of everything else and probably be a lot more efficient. So that's the, the uh, central idea here, I guess. Um, so right now, we've been looking mostly at um, and complex displays, head-mounted displays, um, heads-up displays, and so on, and this welding mask. But there's, of course, a much uh, simpler way to, to get augmented reality, which is to just use a, a regular mobile device as a kind of window into the virtual world. This is still augmented reality, in a sense. So you still have this alignment. You have a mix of real and virtual content. And you have some interaction capability using the touch screen. Usually, you don't have um, uh, 3D here, except, of course, if you use something like Google Cardboard. But then, again, you run into this kind of parallax issue because the camera is, for, is often just offset to one side, uh, and it's just a single one. You already talked, of this, talked about this. The big problem here, in general, is now to do some kind of location tracking, um, or first determine the location, and then do uh, the tracking. Okay, so now let's look at different ways how we can actually can actually achieve that. So um, there are quite a number of, of different approaches. The most straightforward one would be to just use 
location from GPS and IOU data. This is something mostly suitable for outside. Um, but we can also use the camera. We can use either some kind of depth camera or we can use so-called SLAM algorithms. I'll go into a bit more detail uh, on these now. So the, the simplest approach, which is more or less already directly built into your, uh, uh, your device, is to just use the GPS data to get your location and then get the, uh, send the IMU data for determining which direction you're looking at. And um, then you can, for example, do something like this. You can um, put, put labels on, on landmarks, for example, on mountain tops or on big buildings or something like that, because the, um, the accuracy isn't that good. GPS maybe one two or, or two meters, and the uh, IMU maybe may five degrees of accuracy. Um, so if you really want to to pinpoint one specific window in this in the skyscraper, then that probably won't work. But you can just put a big label on top of the entire thing, and it will sort of align. So uh, there's, uh, for example, layer. I think. It, it's called on the Wikitude browser. These are apps which follow this approach and which just give you information about the large scale things outdoors. For example, like if you uh, if you're in the mountains and want to know what the mountain top over there is called, then this is for example an app which can can give or an approach which can give you that information. Um, of course, you, what you need to know for this example to work here is um, at least some kind of height information on top of things. So, um, you, of course, you get your 6D pose of, of the device where you're looking through, but um, you would still need to know how, how high these skyscrapers uh, approximately are so that you can put the label about in the right position. This is again rather a, a rather rough approach in general, but uh, for for this kind of scenario, it's probably sufficient. Um, okay, so the next more complex step would be any kind of vision-based tracking where we use the camera. Um, so the primary goal, just as before, is to get six degrees of freedom uh, data where is my viewpoint, basically. So where's the tablet looking, or the phone. Um, and the secondary goal now, when I use vision, would be to also create an environment map. So if I'm in an unknown environment, indoors, then I could use the data from the camera to actually create a map, which I can then maybe uh, also interact with. Um, so there's two fundamental fundamentally different approaches. One would be to use a, a depth camera. Um, so you can of course have something like the Kinect and people have also been putting the Kinect on mobile devices, but this is custom hardware so it's, and it's very bulky. There's actually one or two devices which you can buy now from, uh, it's called Project Tango from Google and I think in a few months there will be uh, the first uh, consumer phone from Lenovo, which also has a depth camera built in. Um, but not many people have access to this kind of hardware, so the, if, if you want to, to reach a broad user base, then you need some kind of solution which can use one single uh, color camera as it's built into um, any phone. And there, again, you have also two different ways to do this, either using so-called fiducials, uh, printed markers, or uh, with this kind of slam angle. So um, now briefly, let's briefly look into depth cameras. Um, this is mostly something for a different lecture, I just want to mention it briefly. So the central idea is that for every pixel you don't just get color information, but you also get distance information. And that makes it quite easy to um, for example, create a map of the environment um, because you can actually know how far things are, so you get a 3D, 3D information about every point. And if you have stereo cameras, then you get 
two color images, which are slightly different, exactly the way the human eyes work too. And then you need to find so-called correspondences between these images. This is something for the computer vision lecture. I won't go into too much detail here. Um, but when you then know the, the exact lens and the distance between the cameras and so on, it has sound pixels which correspond to each other, so which are the same point in the real world in both images, then you can use that to calculate the distance. Um, the other approach, which also in this project Tango, for example, is to use a dedicated depth camera. They usually, these usually are based on some kind of uh, uh, infrared laser projector, which, uh, for example, projects a pattern into the environment. And by looking at how that pattern is distorted by the environment with a second dedicated camera, you can also calculate the distance to each um, point in the image. Um, this is called structured light. The other type of depth camera is called time of flight. They really measure the time it takes for, for the light to travel out and come back again. And these are quite complex, so they're not usually found in uh, mobile devices, as far as I know. Uh, the one that you can get currently for this kind of time of flight camera is the Kinect 2. Um, but most of the things you can get into a mobile device are either structured light or stereo cameras. And the, the big disadvantage is that any kind of depth camera you need extra hardware. So you can't just take any smartphone off the shelf. You really need at least a second camera or maybe a laser projector or whatever. And it will of course also use a lot more battery then. So that's the, the big drawback. On the other hand, if you really want to rely just on the single camera, which just about every smart device has uh, now, then you can use some, you, you will need to use some, some kind of either marker-based approach. So the simplest ones are these. You get a big, uh, clearly defined black border and some symbol in the center, and then you can put some kind of virtual content on top of that, of that target. So there's different toolkits available for that kind of, of interaction. Um, a slightly more advanced version is uh, called uh, image targets or markerless tracking. That's, for example, for this kind of, of augmented book. This, uh, so this entire image is basically uh, known to the app and the app tries to localize that image or different ones in the camera screen and then uh, you can determine from knowing how the original image looks and how it's, how it's distorted and, uh, and moved in the uh, camera image, you can determine the uh, position and then can again put uh, 3D content on top of it. So in both cases the idea is to, sim to somehow detect the, uh, the pose in relation to one of these targets. Um, the, yeah, again, the, the most simple approach is this one. Um, slightly more sophisticated one is here um, because the, uh, the targets can basically look like whatever you want them to. Um, the one limitation is that they can't really have any uh, or many repeating elements because then the tracking won't work. Anymore. I'll just briefly talk about why this uh, is the case. So this image-based tracking uses a, a algorithm called SIF, SIF or something related. This stands for Scale Invariant Feature Transform. And um, the, the SIF algorithm finds points or small areas in an image which are uh, very unique which have uh, unique properties and which also don't really change when you rotate the image or, uh, or flip it um, or look at it from an angle. So they should all, these SIFT uh, descriptors should always look mostly the same. And now the important part is that I can match these across images. So let's assume that this is our image target 
um, where we want to put 3D content on top, and this is the, the camera image with lots of um, lots of different stuff going on. Um, and now, if I look at uh, the SIF descriptors, then I can determine that there is a uh, connection with a lot of similar SIF descriptors between this area in the big image and this area in the small image. And as you can see, there are a few mismatches. So some of the SIF descriptors from the, from the template match over here and match over here, but by far the largest part matches with the actual card in the, um, in the big image. And this is basically how the, uh, um, the tracking algorithm first finds the image target and then you have to calculate the transformation from this, uh, from this template to the, actual, to the actual camera image. So how is it rotated, how is it uh, uh, shifted and from that you can then determine the six degrees of freedom relative to that target and can, for example, put some additional information on top of it. 